This is the Art of Network Engineering podcast. In this podcast, we'll explore tools, technologies, and talented people. We aim to bring you information that will expand your skill sets and toolbox and share the stories of fellow network engineers. Do you all smell that? There's something in the air, but I just can't put my finger on it. Rather, maybe not in the air, but out in the ether or the ethernet. You know, Lexi reads that book about ethernet. It's got an octopus on it. That'd be pretty wild if that's what ethernet smelled like, wouldn't it? Did you know that a group of octopuses is called a consortium? They're just so dignified. What am I talking about again? I think I'm freaking out, man. Wait, what's that up on the screen? Oh, that's what's wrong. Hey, who left Wireshark running again? I've been in here sniffing packets all day. All right, well, while I air it out in here, enjoy this episode of The Art of Network Engineering. You know, Tim started sniffing and I got real worried. I thought we were in the same room again. Uh, and I was like, oh, man. Uh, <laughs> welcome to The I've Art got- of Network Engineering. Tim, thank you so much for that intro. That was, that was awesome. Uh, very... Very well done intro, considering our topic this evening. Uh, I am joined tonight by Tim at Timbertino. Tim, how you doing? I'm good, AJ. But I mean, even if we were in the same room, I've got all my shots. <laughs> I'm up to date. <laughs> That's, I don't. I don't have to wear the cone thing anymore, so we're good. Wasn't, uh, wasn't worried about you sniffing that. Oh, <laughs> oh, this is a different kind of show. Okay. <laughs> Oh gosh. <laughs> I, I'm doing good, AJ. It's uh at the time of this recording, it's getting to be the, the fall time of year. Um I'm kind of a college football nut, so I got oh, I, boy. I'm in my ha- I'm in my happy place. You are so you are. That's awesome. I'm good. Things are good. I how you doing? I, I heard a stat last Saturday there was like fifty eight college football games playing like that day. How did you watch them all, Tim? Like I know I know you got like more than one TV in your basement. Did you have fifty eight? <laughs> Not last weekend. We were actually out and about, but I, I will be I will be in my command center on Saturday. Command I'm ready. Center. That's it's it's really the knock for where you work, but you just put cable on go. all the like TVs. That. I'm gonna start calling it that. I there like that. There you go. There you go. All right. And he is back, Dan at Howdy Packet. If uh, if we were live streaming his uh, his arrival this evening, uh, you know he he's been gone all summer. He's he's had a lot on his plate. Uh, he was playing Back in Black by ACDC as he joined our stream here prior to going live. So it was very very good uh, intro song. Dan, how you doing? Good to see you again. Hey Jay, I'm uh, doing wonderful. I uh, got a new baby girl. Um, congratulations. congratulations! We sold our house, so I'm in a, I'm in a family owned rental at the moment. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like my life right now. (laughs) (laughs) Hang on. He's, he's been gone for a little bit. I wasn't going to say it was too long, but he's been gone long enough that he didn't say howdy. Uh, Anybody else catch that? He said, hi. I I was going to say howdy. And then AJ kept going on. So I, it slipped my mind. I'm ADHD. So if like, I don't say it, I forget it. (laughs) Excellent. Well, Dan, it's good to have you back. And good last but not least, Mr. Andy Laptef. Andy, do you have a pool yet? It's been all summer. I do. Yeah. All right. All right. I will direct you to his YouTube channel to see it firsthand. <laughs> <laughs> you, you put up a YouTube video on how to scrub a pool? Cannonball, God. man. Yeah, I think it cannonball. was a cannonball. Oh, all right. All right. Yeah, that's I think. It's, he uploaded it yesterday. Come on. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long it's been a long time coming and uh yeah we we opened it and we got to swim in it and you really got to brush plaster a lot which sure. i didn't foresee you know i wanted a big house till i had to clean it i wanted a big yard till i had to mow it you know i wanted a big <laughs> pool until i had to scrub every square inch of it twice a day for a month it takes me an hour each time so you know like but no we, we we got in it the other day we had some friends over it was just you know it was all worth it uh, the kids got home from school today and like, daddy, we want to go in a pool and great. It's, you know, so it's, yeah, it's, it's been, uh, it's been really nice. Other than that, everybody's good. Happy to see Dan. It's good to be on here. Uh, how you doing AJ? What's going on with you? 
Doing good. Doing real good. Uh, man, things are so busy at work, but I love it. It's a good busy. I have uh, my first Vermont customer we mm. kicked off a project with a few weeks ago, uh, so it's very nice not to be uh, driving down to the Boston area for once. <laughs> not that I mind that. It's just really nice. I, I appreciate having a, a customer in my own backyard, and I've got a few projects lined up that will keep me um, in state uh, for, for a little while, so pretty excited about that. Um, Drone stuff's really taken off, pun intended. Yes. Uh, I see what you did there. <laughs> do, doing a lot of drone photography, uh, having a ton of fun with that, and uh, yeah, it's it's a good time. Um, so. Yo, I got to give you props. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. So listen, I'm an amateur photographer, right? I've even been paid for a gig or two. And I saw you get into the drone stuff, and I'm like, oh, he's adorable. Look at this. Isn't this cute? <laughs> You know what I mean? This is really cool. He's going to be a photographer, right? And then and then some of your shots, I'm like, okay, yeah. Like, but, dude, the ones you just sent me from your mass trip, like, next yeah. level. Like, you're just, you're, 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 you're locked in, dude. So, yeah, really, uh, I can now say rock on, dude. You're doing some really nice, <laughs> really nice. Work. That one, that one sunset with the silhouettes of all the boats. Yeah. And I think there was, like, a little, like, dude. It's like a work of art, so great, thank great. you. I'm really enjoying it now. Yeah, yeah, I really job, appreciate dude. that. Um, I I do a little uh, Instagram separate from my own uh, no blinky blinky account. If you're interested in checking out my my drone photography, you can go to at drone journey vt for drone journey of Vermont. That was the intention. Uh, but yeah, as Andy said, I took a trip down to Massachusetts this past weekend for the long weekend, uh, and uh, yeah, brought the drone. And um, my wife grew up in the Rockport area, so. Took some really cool shots of the Rockport Harbor and uh, had a great time doing it. So lots of fun. But that's not why we gathered here tonight. I am very excited. We are talking about capturing packets, as uh, Tim alluded to, and we brought no other than Chris Greer to join us and, and lead the discussion. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here, gentlemen. Thanks for having me tonight. <laughs> when when uh when we usually interview guests we want to go over just a little bit of your career give us a little bit of background how you got started in, in network engineering and more importantly how did you get to focus on uh capturing packets and and, uh, and kind of what you do today um just the the cliff notes if you will sure yeah no problem and i think uh like a lot of you guys i've i've heard on previous shows that uh, just getting started in networking, having a passion for it, getting excited about moving traffic around, um, making things work end to end. It, it, it hooks you quickly, you know? So that's something that uh, I got onto early in my career. I was hired by a company to come in and just do some internship stuff on just building small networks and getting things up and going. Um, I started going to trade shows. So specifically NetWorld Interop was one that I... Uh, started to help set up those event networks. And that's where things got to a much larger scale. And I started getting some more certifications, vendor certifications, Cisco and otherwise. Mm -hmm. But it, when I was at those shows, I started to see a bit of an interesting, just, a, just a, a niche within the IT sphere. And that was that we started to have these really weird issues on the network. And of course, the network's getting blame. I mean, this is nothing that's gone, right? We still all have weird stuff happens. Oh, sure. But uh, at that time, what was interesting to me is you had top dogs from Cisco and Foundry and Extreme Networks at the time and you know all these other big players. They, they were there and they had some of their best guys. And a problem would strike. And everyone's just hammering away at their keyboards and this problem's just continuing on. And then these other guys would be over here in this corner and they were capturing traffic and looking through, through things at the packet level. And sure enough, 99.9999% of the time, unless it was some bug that needed to be patched, they would come back and they would be able to pinpoint the problem, just boom. If they couldn't fix it, at least within minutes, they could get it down to the, like maybe we don't know exactly what it is, but that box over there, that server, that device, that client, that something – is spending 20 seconds responding to whatever. Mm -hmm. That's the device we got to focus on. Mm. I was hooked. <laughs> That's awesome. And what did like, you call them? This? Oh yeah, so so they got those people got a name on the team and it was the packet heads, right? Packet heads. So <laughs> nice. we'd get a problem and then boom, packet heads. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see my packet head shirt. That's a uh, um or if you follow me on social media, just go to at @packetpioneer and you'll see my logo there, but 
uh, that's something that uh, for me, it was such a career changing moment to go, whoa, you know, I got to I building the infrastructure, the highways and byways and the speeds and feeds is fun, hands down. But understanding the traffic that is traversing those speeds and feeds and how it actually works and the protocols within that, that make that, that carry all this important traffic that once I really started to get into that again, it was that those aha moments started clicking and uh, I, I really got passionate about analyzing and, and uh, troubleshooting with packet captures. That's awesome. You know, pa packet captures is like. One of those things that I, I did it a lot when I was studying for, for CCNA and I do it not, not a ton, but every so often, but every time I do it, I'm like, why don't I do this more? Mm -hmm. It's just so right. insightful. I, I, I was telling the team um, a few weeks ago, I, I troubleshot a BGP issue with uh, Cisco endpoint and uh, NSX edge tier zero. And um, we did a packet capture and we saw it's setting up the TCP connection it's sending the bgp initiation from the cisco side but then we're getting a um a tcp what was it um like a tcp drop or something right and it's just like well well that's not the right response and so we didn't know exactly what was causing the problem but we knew the problem was over here on the nsx side right because cisco was setting up the bgp um but nsx wasn't responding properly so we we had to have another team member come in and, and deal with the NSX side, and we got it figured out eventually. But without doing that PCAP, we wouldn't have known what exactly was going on. Oh, 100%. Yeah. yeah. And and I think now, um, you know, for a lot of my career, I've been on the performance troubleshooting side. So so now as a trait, what I do is I fix stuff for people that send me PCAPs. Mm -hmm. mm. Right? They send me the capture. They go, hey, here was the general thing. Weird disconnect, uh, slow. Of course, the network's getting blamed just fingers pointing around the data center. We just got to get this thing fixed. Here's a PCAP, so help out. So so I do that. And I also, on the other half of my world, I do uh, training for Wireshark University through the Wireshark Shark Foundation. So uh, I love teaching it too. So that's why I started up my YouTube channel and it, it's fun helping people get started with it. Nice. So what's that email awesome. address? I might have to send you some packets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Hit me up, man. <laughs> For sure. Like, I know a guy. Hold on. Is that a paid service? Like people will pay you to look at their PCAPs and tell them the problem? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. That yeah. is awesome. I want to point out two things. One, AJ used the past tense incorrectly of troubleshoot. He said troubleshot. Oh, sorry. I believe it's troubleshat. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> that sounds right. <laughs> Sorry. Or shard. What, yeah. Trouble shard. Yeah. Trouble shard. Yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Well played. But the other the other thing I wanted to mention, we were talking before the show, but, uh, you know, AJ, to your point, like, you've, you've, you've solved problems doing packet captures, and, you know, people are paying Chris to, like, look at PCAPs, and I somehow spent a decade working in very large networks of very large companies, and I've never run a packet capture myself. Now, I have seen the wizards, like you said, the packet heads, Chris. <laughs> like, in our company, there would be, like, one or two people at the knock. You know, we're all banging our heads against the wall in this weird thing, and it's been going on for days, and it's intermittent, blah, 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 right? We just can't catch it. And the people in the know, right? The people who can see the matrix, which is what it's like to me. You know, you guys can just see what's happening behind the, you know, behind the scenes. And, and yeah, invariably, they always figure it out, right? That weird. So I, I'm really looking forward to you talking about and showing us some stuff tonight because this is definitely a blind spot of mine. Have you seen yeah, the sure. uh, the so, shame meme? The shame, shame, yeah. shame. <laughs> that's me right now to you, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. It's, it's deserved. So, yeah, nah. can, can we, uh, can we kind of take it back to basics? I, I want to start off, Chris, if we can kind of break down some terminology um, when it comes to this kind of topic, I think it's easy to to use multiple terms to mean the same thing, and and some you know sometimes that's not always the case. So, can you kind of walk us through at least at a high level, you know, what is a packet capture, what's Wireshark, and what's a PCAP? It's a it's a great question because it really just depends on who you're talking to sometimes mm -hmm. and which one they'll use. The industry typically is going to call it PCAP or trace file. Like for a long time, I used trace file, like, Hey, send me a trace of that. And then, um, I had a student in one class. He said, do you mean a PCAP? You know, and that's usually the extension <laughs> on the end of the, yeah. um, of the, the trace file or the, the packet capture. Oh, is that where PCAP so, comes from? It's the file. Extension? Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. that's that. Well, that's Got one it. of. There's probably some amazing history that someone knows, you know, deeper than I do on the actual, okay. you know, origin of that. But um, yeah, so so PCAP or PCAP NG, uh, you'll see a lot these days. But uh, yeah, so so either trace file, packet capture. So Wireshark, let's talk about that for a moment. Um, so uh, Wireshark is a the world's basically the world's best open source packet capture tool. And uh, underneath it, it uses a driver called NPCAP, which is actually from the NMAP organization. Mm. So uh, it it's a GUI-based uh, packet analysis tool that is free. You go out there to download it and you install it. And what's cool about Wireshark is because it's open source and it has a very large contribution to developers – a lot of times when you'll see experimental protocols or maybe somebody with the IETF is, is tinkering with something new, a lot of times you'll see support for that protocol come to Wireshark first. Mm, okay. So say, for example, Quick, uh, the Quick protocol that's um, come out just in the last year as a standard, uh, you saw the, the dissectors for it show up in Wireshark first because the guys that are actually writing the protocol need to see it, right? So they use okay. Wireshark to dissect what they're working on, mm. then that all goes back into the actual tool itself. So that's one of the reasons why it uh, has such a, um, it's such a solid tool because it has such a, a community involvement to it. So the, the tool that we'll use to capture would be something like Wireshark. That's the one that I use the most. You also have other vendors that have their own packet collection and analysis tools. A lot of times those cost quite a bit of money because they also have hardware on top of it. Mm. So purpose-built stuff that's <clears> designed <throat> to keep up with a 100-gig stream. So, um, But packet collection is its own um, section of our industry. But I think the most common tool in, in most network engineers' toolbox for packet collection would be Wireshark. So how do I get the packets to Wireshark? Like I've wanted to run a packet capture at home and I just have no idea to start. Like I know in big organizations, there's like a tap, right? And it just sure. moves everything over to somewhere and they capture it that way. Like yeah. how do I, I have a laptop, I install Wireshark. Mm -hmm. how, how do I get packets to it to look at? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so the first thing, the simplest way is if you can generate or break or experience whatever it is you're troubleshooting, from your machine itself, you can start up that capture locally, break whatever it is, then stop the capture. And you can do that with Wireshark. Hit the blue fin, break it, hit the stop. Boom, you've got a, a PCAP off of whatever interface you selected. So a lot of times if I'm working with one of my clients, that's what I'll have them do. Is there any way that I can get them to just experience locally from a machine? Now there's a few things, there's a, some gotchas there. Whenever I'm capturing from within the device that is generating the application. There's a few uh, one-offs I got to consider. Like it might not see it the same way as it is on the network, right? The NIC, mm. is, the NIC can change things. The TCP stack can change things. But Andy, the, the next way that, that uh, we can get started, and I actually literally just did this on my home network. I bought a $50 little managed switch. It's got a span port on there. Mm -hmm. So now I go from my home router through that switch, copy everything to and from my edge router over to the, the span port or the, the um, switch port analyzer port or the mirror port, whatever it calls it. And from there I can plug in. I went ahead and bought a Raspberry Pi and stuck a little credit card size SSD on that thing. And now I'm streaming to disk 500 gigs at my, my house. Everything coming and going from my network is being captured. Wow. So it doesn't take a lot of, I mean, I built the whole thing for 250 bucks. I'm actually going to talk about it on my YouTube channel, but it doesn't take a whole lot of hardware to get started. You know, we can just start with the laptop. So you know? just so I, just so I follow. So you have your edge router at home and you connect it to a switch. So mm -hmm. all your traffic is coming through that switch mm -hmm. in and out. And then you just create a span port off of that, which takes everything coming through that device, sends it out this other port called a span port. And you connect that, do you connect your laptop into that span port? Like Correct. How, how does Wireshark, okay, so you, that's it's it. coming out of that span port, boop, I'm in, Wireshark grabs it. Okay, I'm Correct. with you. And then I can have maybe, let's just say I had a USB to RJ45 connection, right, to make it cabled, because a lot of devices don't have 
RG45. So if I have, if I use that to plug into the switch, then I can manage that device wirelessly or that's what I'm doing with my Raspberry Pi, right? Okay. It only works though, Andy, if you actually make the boop sound yeah. the boop, <laughs> boop, when you plug oh, it. Oh, if you don't do that, you missed it. <laughs> yeah. You're going to miss the event. <laughs> so uh, that's a, that's a good question. So, so that's the second way you can either locally capture to and from your own local machine. Another way is you can use a span or mirror port. You have to in a switched environment, right? Because switches are going to isolate frames to, uh, especially unicast frames are only going to go between those two interfaces. The third way would be a tap. And that's when I want to spend a little bit of money and I got a bit more, you know, <clears throat> more power, <laughs> you know, behind it. Um, pounding that's my hardware, chest. right? Is it tap hardware? Yeah. And that's where I actually literally physically break a connection, snap it in physically, snap in whatever else. Let's just say a server array, pull it out, pop in my tap, plug it back in. It's back up and running. And that, 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 that tap is now physically in line. Okay. Then it has analyzer ports that you then plug your analyzer to. Gotcha. So I'd like, uh, Chris, I'd like to get your take on this. Cause I'm, I typically work with Cisco, right? So, um, one of the things that I've been using lately, um, and, and I've got actually an interesting use case. Um, so like you had mentioned earlier, the the collective we as is network folks we always seem to to have to prove that the network's not at fault right so right. we uh, troubleshooting is a is a huge use case for um, packet capture we we actually had an issue where there was this print server that had to uh, to print jobs to these little uh, uh, ticket printers to to print out orders for different things and every now and again these printers would just stop. And, and the people that were expecting the prints um, just had no idea that, that there were orders that were supposed to be spitting out um, and, and they weren't. So they, it, it was pretty detrimental for them when this didn't happen. And their fix was that they just had to basically power cycle the printer and they it would come back up and none of the jobs that were supposed to print, print it out, but any new jobs w- would come through. So it was obviously the network's fault, right? We were just just gobbling up them packets and, and eating them. Um, so I, I am not by any means a, a packet capture expert, but I'm halfway decent at clicking on shit till it works. <laughs> um, and, and one thing that I really like about the, uh, the newer Cisco switches, and I, I, I'd love to get your opinion. I'm, I'm guessing you work, um, have worked with multi-vendor switches is that they have basically an embedded packet capture feature. Yeah. So you can just build a packet capture on the switch, pick your source port, your destination port, or your source VLAN, whatever, and it'll just create the file locally, and then you can chip it off SCP or whatever and, and view it in Wireshark. Are you seeing that with uh, that kind of feature with other vendors as well? Oh, 100%. Yeah, that's coming. And and it well, it's been here. And I would say, like, in the, beyond even switches, but, like, firewalls yeah. and, you know, being able to do TCP dump on a box mm-hmm. and and so on. Uh, so here's the deal, guys. I've been bit hard by that. Okay. Oh. So I've been bit hard by that. And that, and what I mean is, um, this is why I write my statements of work real specifically. So if there's any unexpected outages that happen because of some weird bug on some device, it's not my fault. You can't sue me. So um, basically, like, we need to take into consideration, well, first of all, if the network's getting blamed for slowness, now we're adding another job for that thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, and then the other thing is, at what point will Cisco prioritize the packet capture function versus the forwarding function? Sure. Because I've done some benchmarking with um, just tinkering. These are articles that I've written in the past. Maybe we can link them or share them or whatever, but... Where, okay, uh, if a, let's just take basic switch, two interfaces, packet comes in, I expect switch goes, whoa, packet important, forward pocket onto next link. But when I give it a job to do, I can't trust that now. Is it, yeah. it going to go receive packet, make copy, save to buffer? Then pre then process, then do what it's got to do and forward it on. Is it going to delay the forwarding? Hopefully it won't. But 
Um, where I've got, gotten bit in the past is um, when buffers like that can fill or even unexpectedly become taxed. I've seen it dump switches and completely reboot them on oh, massive wow. application arrays. Um, I haven't seen it recently, but I'm gun shy enough that I have a bit of a policy. If I can, now this is where I get to be a little bit of an elitist, right? If I can, I want the firewalls to firewall. I want the routers to route. I want the switches to switch. switch. I want the taps to tap. And I want the analyzers to capture that stuff. That's what they're designed to do. Mm, okay. Mm-hmm. If I cannot do any of the things that I just said, and I have no choice, and my client lives in Germany, and they have no packet capture or taps or span capabilities, then go down the path of what's the next worst option. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I think it's cool that these options are coming to the infrastructure, but uh, it wouldn't be my first way to capture it if I had yeah. the choice. So let me ask you yeah. – um, so I've done a lot of captures on like ASAs before. Um, I've done a lot mm-hmm. of that. I don't know. Are, are you saying that that might not be the best way to do that? Like, like directly on the well, box? Now that device. Sure. Sure. That's a good question. Um, anytime you capture within the device that is involved in the path, it's mm-hmm. going to give you its perspective. Right. So how did that box shape that um, stream? Did, did we really see it as it was on the wire? I gotcha. Right? So there's nothing, Dan, there's nothing, I, I would never discourage people and say, I don't make blanket absolute statements because then as soon as you do, you find the exception, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> so I never say never because tomorrow I could get a client that says, hey, I got an ASA capture. What can we do with it? Okay, give me the capture. <laughs> yeah. You know, but, but uh, best would be uh, external to the active device. Okay. And uh, tap is always going to be the best. If you can't, span would be my second best. Okay. And then if I can't, then physically on that device. Because, again, people always blame the firewall, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, well, if I'm capturing on that firewall, how do I know that that, that process yeah. isn't... They're not going to believe you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what your firewall right. says, but... <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. I already don't trust that yeah. guy. Well, and actually, I, but, I had a... Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to... Who did I jump on just now? Oh, uh, I was just going to say, I mean, to, to finish off the, the, uh, printer story, I, I cannot tell you how good of a feeling it was to have that packet capture going, have the, uh, the end user tell me, okay, it happened at this time. Mm-hmm. We're not getting any prints at all right now. Um, because basically we told them, you know, when this happens, let us know when you, um, have to power cycle that printer. So look through that packet capture and and the feeling I got to be able to see that that the printer received the job and acknowledged the fact that it received the job and just never printed it was was huge because at that point you're just saying, okay, <laughs> we can prove to you that the printer got it. <laughs> yeah. So figure out if it's if it's firmware, if it's hardware, whatever. We we can prove that the packets made it through the network and got to your printer. Not only that, but your printer said, yes, I got it. Yeah. That was cool. And from what you just said, that's where the terms, uh, or the term packets don't lie came from. Yeah. Packets don't lie. I know my stuff got there cause it acted. Yeah. Network's done, homie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I actually have a capture. I was going to show you guys, uh, just, um, but I, I I don't know if I can talk with, talk talk through a screen share, but just to give you the high level, um, a client of mine was like, "Hey, we're getting, network guys, we're just getting beat up on and shredded because of this issue. It's slow. The clients hit this one tab and it's just crawling. Like, man, just just can you help get the blame off of us?" And they were getting hammered with the blame, like the network sucks. The network sucks. Mm. We found out that the clients were connecting to this server. TCP connection, boom, boom, boom. A lot happens in that TCP handshake. There's a ton we can unpack there, but I'll, I'll withhold the excitement to go down that road. Um, but that at least tells me my network round trip time right away. I don't need a ping. If you give me a PCAP with a TCP conversation, boom, off the first handshake, I can tell the network round trip time, boom. So now I know the latency. Latency wasn't too bad. No retransmissions. 
request goes to server, server acts it immediately. Exactly the same round trip time. So I know the network's not congested because latency is not shifting. Mm. It's not dropping anything because I have no packet loss. So request goes, act comes back immediately. 45 seconds later, the client checks into the server like it, it sends a TCP keep alive. Mm -hmm. Because the application was taking so long to respond, TCP had to say, whoa, I haven't been told to shut this down yet. So, hey, uh, server, you still there? Oh, wow. Server hits back immediately. Network latency never changed. Oh. Yep, still here. So client waits another 45 seconds. Checks in again. TCP keep alive. Server's like, yo, I'm here. It's like if you ever call into a call center and, you know, they're just like, uh, thank you for calling. Please hold. And, <laughs> and then 45 seconds later, they come back. You still there? Good. Please hold. Yeah. And then 45 seconds again. You still there? Please hold. So that's what's happening. Well, finally, 108 seconds was the application response time oh, wow. before that application actually sent data back to us. In seven packets, we were able to prove that the network had no congestion at all. Latency was like a clock, no loss, no packet loss. It is not the network. It is 100% that application. So who the hell, this is a guy who knows nothing about software development. Who in the right mind would write an application and say that two and a half minutes is an acceptable time to wait to send a response to a no. request? Like, they didn't, that, they didn't write that okay. in. Huh? -uh. It, it was a backend congested process. Mm. So it wasn't even the server uh, that was responding slow, quote unquote, slowly. Something behind it was. It was trying to talk to somewhere else before it responded and something yeah. was hung up on the back end. Okay. N now here's what's frustrating as a client. I was hired by the network guys. As soon as I got the blame off the network, they're like, okay, bye. Thanks. It's not us. <laughs> like, but 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 what is it then? Oh, well, yeah. that's not what we're paying you. That's not what we're paying you for. So get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> you don't you, you don't get any closure. Oh man, curiosity kills me. That happens. Yeah. That happens a lot, though. You'd be surprised. <laughs> yeah. As soon as I get the blame off of whatever whoever is paying the the money, it just depends on if the other t uh, silo is motivated to actually fix it. <laughs> They're like, "Hey, <"K>, bye." <laughs> right. Exactly. Thank you. So so, so we hired Chris. You for. We've <laughs> talked about uh, we've talked about troubleshooting being a big reason why you'd capture packets what are what are some other use cases that that people would want to do this oh boy cybersecurity, just one thousand percent like okay in fact um even for me um in my my teaching i used to do just just network performance troubleshooting i was always listening for two words intermittent and weird <laughs> If I hear either one of those, let's go. Let's get a Wireshark out and let's 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 figure out what's up and let's teach you to do what we are doing here. You know, make sense of the matrix, like Andy said earlier, which is actually something I say in my courses. So we're thinking the same way, Andy. Yes. Um. Yeah. But uh, on the, over the past few years, I've had to pivot hard into the cyber conversation. In that, hey, um, hey, Chris, are we getting hacked? Is data being exfiltrated? Do you see anything strange, any anomalous behavior, any, any malware? Are we getting scanned? And this has happened. It's starting to pick up pace where they hire me to come in and do a performance gig. Hey, this application is slow. And then I find out, well, that's weird. Your IoT device over there is sending out some Nmap looking scan activity. Why would your light bulb be scanning your network? <laughs> That, that's what I was going to ask. You get asked those kind of questions. Hey, do you see anything weird or anomalous when you're looking through a packet capture file? When you hear that, what is there something specific you're looking for or just things that don't look right? What are you looking for? That's a great question, Tim. That's the money question, really. It's uh, what does weird look like? Yeah. And uh, I think... Exactly. I, I ask that what in the mirror every morning. <laughs> <laughs> you mean you answer it in the mirror? <laughs> well, yeah, he talks back. Yeah, <laughs> and that's why you're on a podcast, right? Yeah. Not a video yep, stream. Yep. <laughs> no, um, thanks for radio for sure. <laughs> no, uh, um, I I think the one of the ways that I go threat hunting is I remove. Uh, and, and that's where we always have to make some assumptions, even though we can be wrong with anything with cyber. 
let's get rid of what we expect to see. And then let's come in with what's left. Now, that's a place that ha hackers can lurk. So just because it, things don't look weird doesn't mean they didn't make it look normal, right? So you always have to ask yourself questions like, should Dan be talking to AJ and sending him a gig of traffic at one in the afternoon? There, you know, those are questions. Um, why is Dan talking to XYZ country? You know, if we don't have any clients over there and... Does he, is he even aware? Is he talking to you know, North Korea or? You can spit, you can spit out any country you want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like those are the things that we start to look at and go, Hey, um, and, and this goes a little bit beyond packet capture, Tim, there's other tools that can help us to do this because the, the writer or the original author of Wireshark, Gerald Combs says it best. He's like, you're, when you break out Wireshark, you're investigating an elephant with a microscope. Hmm. Like, why don't we back hmm. up and look at where the micros, if, if the elephant's limping, then we can hone in on a certain area, <laughs> but we can't run in and just look at that guy with the big old microscope and just hope we find the right thing. We got to kind of start hundred thousand foot and then dig down, which there's some other tools that help us to do that. But, um, packet capture. So back to your original question, what are some other use cases, cybers, the hmm. conversation out there right now? I didn't even consider there were other use cases. I thought it was just people trying to fix broken, weird networks. Do, do you remember that story years back where a casino got hacked through a fish tank thermometer? No way. Yeah. <laughs> but it was the same kind of thing you're talking about. Like hackers got in through an IoT device, got a foothold into the network, started digging around, and somehow got into like a high roller database and pulled the data through the network, through the fish tank thermometer, and out to like the cloud and got... Information. It, it was like a big, you know, like uh, it, it was a big thing that, that IoT stuff. But that's so smart that like you can look at the, at the captures and see right. Like why, <laughs> why is our database talking through this thermometer <laughs> in a fish tank? Right? right. Like to your point, yeah. It just it doesn't make any sense. But do they have software that does that, or, and, and people just don't have the money for it? Like, do they have stuff that just watches like cyber? Right. Oh yeah. And, yeah. 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 Hundred percent, and I mean now that's what our you know IDS IPS systems intrusion detection is uh, designed to do to watch. Hey, I on any given Monday, Andy talks to Tim, Dan, and AJ, and that's it. Why is he suddenly having a conversation with Chris, who lives yeah. in Zimbabwe? I, I don't know, but you know, like th this is not typical of Andy. Mm -hmm. So that is now. Right behavior-based analysis and all that comes from the traffic patterns as a human being that's hard for me to do right so that's why we got to use some of these tools because we can't keep up with 10 gig feeds and just with the naked eye but that doesn't mean that wireshark can't help us go digging and threat hunting so i bet you andy that happened at defcon probably what you're talking about with the the fish tank it might that's have that's why when I went to DEF CON, man, I turned everything off. I left it all. <laughs> I didn't bring a thing, man. No. Nope. That's, that's what I've heard. If you're going to go to DEF CON, you just kind of leave your personal stuff at home. Like if you absolutely need a phone, get a burner phone. Like <laughs> Turn everything off. Yeah. It sounds like a bad know. idea. So, right. uh, yeah. you know, Tim, uh, another use case I would throw in there is for anybody learning. You know, when, when you're studying for any sort of certification mm -hmm. or if you're just trying to learn this stuff, um, you, you know, take OSPF, for instance, you're trying to learn the protocol. Look at a packet capture of two OSPF routers trying to form an adjacency and you'll, you'll get it. You'll see. Mm -hmm. Right on. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a great way to learn. Hey, real quick. We have a question from the Patreons. Uh, Eric Duke 312 is asking question for Chris. Has he used the hack five packet squirrel and it is a, is it a good tap device? Hmm. Heard of that I, one? I, I've seen it. I, I've just held it in my hand, but I've never practically used it. Uh, so, sorry, I don't have much on that one. Hey, everybody. Lexi here. 
Our friends over at NetAlly just announced the Next Generation Etherscope NXG, the first and only analyzer of its kind that fully supports Wi-Fi 6 and 6E. This powerful all-in-one instrument can help you quickly test, verify, and troubleshoot technology upgrades and base T, PoE, 10 gig, and Wi-Fi 6 and 6E networks. So check it out. Go to netally.com slash etherscope to request a virtual demo. Are we going to actually see, like, I, I don't know what yeah. our plan is let's, tonight. Let's yeah. do it. Let's, let's, uh, let's We're see. We're see what, something. What, do, do you have some PCAPs teed up to show us? Do, do you, are you ready to do like a, a packet capture in real time? Uh, I think it's time to show us what, uh, what Wireshark looks like here. I'm Ooh. currently hacking Dan. So like, I can, <laughs> I can give you a tap if you want. <sighs> I wouldn't be, uh, properly wearing this shirt if I wasn't ready to break up the Wireshark. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this so, might be a good time to tell our listeners, you know, this is an audio podcast, right? But we also have a YouTube feed. So we're we're about to get into a screen share and some really cool packet capture stuff led by Chris. And we'll try to describe to the audio folks what's happening, but lots yeah, of I mean, numbers. Just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, picture it's, it's, picture it's, of the matrix. <laughs> it, that's what I was just gonna say. It's like trying to describe the matrix. So there's uh, red, this green. Might be a... I see uh <laughs> yeah. no. This might well, be a good time to go check out our YouTube feed if you want to see what's happening. But sorry, Chris, go ahead. No, it's all good. I was going to say anybody that uh, has seen my content knows what green means. Those are sins. Hmm. So <laughs> I know that was an attempt at a connection. So no, but actually, so something that I, um, I'm very passionate about doing is uh, going back to the matrix example. Like, like, what is this? I look like I'm looking into an airplane, airplane cockpit, like, ugh. What are all these buttons? Like, what do I actually do? How can I turn this into actionable answers? Well, a lot of that comes down to taking some of the fear out and the confusion and the overwhelming thing, right? This screen is why I think I ran with my tail between my legs when I first saw a pack. I did too. I did too, man. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I never will forget how that felt. So let's go ahead and take this one little bit at a time. It starts with getting a very, very clear picture of what was being experienced. Okay. That will guide me getting into the packet capture. So I start before I look into the packets. If they, if I get a blind PCAP sent my way, Hey Chris, there's a weird problem here. <laughs> I'm not opening that thing up. <laughs> I, I pop right back. Okay, I need to know who, what, where, why, when, how mm. often is it reproducible on demand? Where was this captured from? Uh, what was the capture perspective? Are we confident we even captured it? How far into the capture did you experience it? Did it go away immediately? Uh, did, you did you see it several times during the capture? Did you stop right away? So you need context to make sense of this mountain of data, right? That'll make it easier on me. Yeah, yeah okay. Right. right. Now, I will say, and Chris, correct me, but sometimes... Uh, if you get too granular though, you kind of miss what the problem is because I've, I've looked in here before looking at source destination and what port. And when they tell me the port that they expect it to be working on, come to find out backing up out of that port, it was using a different port that they weren't, they like, uh, you know, sometimes developers they'll use just kind of random high number ports for some of their applications. Well, instead of it using 443, we found it using something completely different. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. And, and so it was like, but I was so focused on trying to figure that out that I missed the what the actual issue was. So I just well, wanted to kind I, of throw that I, out there. But that was that's a good observation because that, that explains, uh, you know, a lot of, I mean, it, that still happens to me, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't open up a PCAP and just, bam, find the answer just yeah. within <laughs> seconds every time. Right. Nobody does. You know, so uh, it's uh, it's asking myself questions. What was the symptom? So let's be clear on the symptom on this example that I have open here. I have uh, just for the listeners, I have 900 packets on my screen. The symptom was there was a, a client that was having connectivity problems to the Internet. All right. So they open up a, a browser, tab one, go out to news.com, whatever works fine. Tab two, go to the weather. No problem. Tab three, check their bank, no problem. Tab four, YouTube, no problem. Tab five, Spotify, cool. Listening to music. Tab six, white page, didn't work. Tab seven, white page, didn't work. Go back to tab six, hit refresh, works. Hmm. Now suddenly tab one isn't working anymore. Hmm. 
Okay, shut the whole browser, start over. All seven tabs, no problem. Now then, you know, as you go throughout your morning, intermittent random connectivity problem affected everybody. It wasn't just this one individual. Network was being blamed, 100%. It's the wireless, it's those dumb APs, it's the this, the that. Oh, we need to upgrade our backbone to 400 gigs per second, even though we have 20 <laughs> employees. <laughs> You know the deal. So, okay. Intermittent connectivity. So things are not establishing. It's, that's different than I got there, no problem. I was in flight and then the site took a dive. Okay. So I just put that, I plunked that in the back of my mind. Well, let's go kind of take a walk. I'm just going to take a walk down the PCAP. Right now I'm just dragging the slider on the right, top to bottom, looking for anything that just jumps out from my eyes. This is called just taking a walk down the PCAP. Chris, I'm right? sorry. Was this like from a span port at the at the business at the company? Like, that's a good question. And in this case, this was taken directly on one of the clients because they didn't have access to change the network during broad daylight, change control. So this this is that first example you gave us earlier, like the yeah. local capture. Okay. I said, do you see it? Can you reproduce it on your client? And they said yes. I said, can you get it on a span? Not now during day. We got to wait till tonight to change. Okay, right. just do it quick and dirty, and we'll see what we find. Yeah, you're not seeing the wire, but this is a good, yeah, you know, yeah, pretty close. Yeah. All right, next, I see something in the PCAP that I call striping. Someone already talked about it, and that's where I have, this is one of the coloring rules that I set up on my copy of Wireshark here. Let me just show you guys what the default is first. Let me just come back to default. If you just open this up in, in Wireshark regularly, this is what you would see. And the gray kind of doesn't jump out quite normally to me, so this is just my eyes. Um, my, some packets are gray, others are red and the gray ones are sins immediately following each sin is this red reset. Mm. Okay. So I'm just going to flip back to the one that I like and that's plain and it's my is way that, or the highway. Is that, that's, is that what RST means in that bracket? Is correct. That reset? Okay. This is a sin. This is reset. Sin means synchronize. This is the beginning of the TCP three-way handshake. Now, almost every time when I see a new sin, I see a reset right after and what my eyes are doing here is over here on the right of the screen in the info column, I can see the client side ephemeral port because that's usually unique. So 49974, for example, this is a SIN going to that server. And then 49974, here's the reset that coincides with that SIN. And yeah. So just, just for maybe young bucks who are tuning in for the first time, TCP should get a SIN, then a SIN act, then an act, right? That's normal. Correct. It should be a, a three-way handshake if a port is open and available. That establishes a connection. The whole reason, not to get too deep in the weeds, that it's called SYN is because we're synchronizing sequence numbers, which allows us to figure out if any data got missing. But here a reset is basically TCP saying talk to the hand. If I hit oh. you on a port you're not listening to, let's just say, Andy, you're not listening to port 100. I say SYN 100. You're going to pop me back a, a reset. Right, so that comes from the other side, not the, but not me, but whoever I'm trying to reach out to, they'll send a reset and say, no, go away. Correct. Resets can happen for other reasons, but that's a common one that you see. You're trying to hit a port that's either not available or there's a handful of other reasons, but that, that's, that's a big one. Okay, so I see resets on new sins, but here's what gets weird. What my eyes do and let's just do this. So resets, right? So let me just come up here to my filter. And someone said earlier that um, uh, that filters can be a pain to remember. And that's absolutely true. <laughs> the only one I know is ip.addr equals equals and then the IP address I need. <laughs> that's a, Hey. That's, that'll get you far, yeah. Dan. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I got, everybody's got to go out and check out my brand new Try Hack Me Room. I just released it last week. Okay. And it's all on Wireshark filters. Okay. Ooh. Okay. Oh, nice. Right. Hands on. It's free. Literally. It's tryhackme.com slash JR slash Wireshark filters. That's the room link. Let's put that link in the, in the description. You can, and that'll pop right to that. And it's just a, it's a whole lab all about Wireshark filters. And you can check that out on my YouTube channel too. Good deal. So, all right. So check us out. Now let's just go down the likelihood road. Here's a client 192.168.1.1 is receiving resets from all these different sources. Look at all these different IPs, guys. Are these all coming from the same network? No. 
Nope. Nope. Are they coming from the same range? Mm-hmm. Let me come down to my source GIP information, and I'm just going to plunk in. Uh, I've got a country code here, so why don't I just say source country? I'm going to right-click that, apply as column. I'm just adding a column upstairs, and I can see that Ooh. there's different countries, United States, Germany, Japan. Quick, quick, quick question, source desk. So I would have assumed source was the client sitting at the laptop, but looking at these addresses, that doesn't appear. The, right. the resets are coming from these oh, different IPs. At, so these are addresses that the resets are coming from. Yeah. See, yeah, so yeah. The, okay. I, the, I all those it. IPs are coming from the, sor- the source column. Okay. The Thanks. client IP is on the destination column, but that was a good. No- that was something good to note. It's so, the source of the packet. Okay. Correct. That makes sense. Gotcha. That is correct. I'm going to remove this. So I can see they're all coming from different places. Now, the symptom was I go and I hit YouTube, and then I hit weather.com and I hit whatever. Now, is it likely that all of those sites simultaneously get together and decide to reset me collectively? They're just picking on me and I'm having a bad day. Some days it feels like that, but no, that's probably not the case. (laughs) (laughs) They don't have an orchestrated reset that all of them are like, do it now guys. (laughs) So I'm like, okay, resets coming from a lot of different quote unquote, places. That's one symptom. I'm just going to remove my filter. Now I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here to the top. This is this packet that this is a SYN, which is a TCP initial connection packet, right? It's at the first one in the PCAP. I'm right clicking this because right click filtering is way easier than typing it all out. I'm going to go to conversation filter. I'm going to base the conversation on the TCP for tuple. What that means both IPs and both ports. So now show me that TCP conversation. I can see here, so I've got just in my initial handshake for all the listeners, SYN goes out and I immediately get a reset back. If I look at my delta time, this is the time between packets. One millisecond later, I get a reset back. Mm -hmm. I try again, half a second later, SYN. Not even a millisecond, 233 microseconds later, I get a reset back. Third time, the client tried one more time. It was probably like the TCP stack was like, look, try three times and then give it up. They're not listening. Try a third time. And then boom, 44 milliseconds later, I get a TCP SYN act. The connection establishes the TLS client. Hello begins. And now this connection is off to the races and things work. So why do I hit my head twice? on two resets, but then the third one works. Now some people, ooh, well, the firewall's blocking that port. Well, you guys know this. A firewall rule is drop or not, right? So if it was a rule doing this, well, then it would never work. Are they single okay. home, the one ISP? Uh, you know, that's a good question. Yes, in this case. I have right. a theory, but okay. keep going. No, let the packets prove it. Get out there. That's right. actually, this is actually something that I like to do uh, with other analysts. Sometimes if I'm just you know stuck on something, I'll call a buddy and say, hey, what do you see that I don't? And we'll just start throwing ideas at it and let the packets prove or disprove what we are thinking. This so. sounds like a really good drinking game, by the way. <laughs> 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 well, sometimes the answer comes to you after you've had a beer or two. Sometimes. <laughs> So, uh, all right, go ahead. Was there another guess or thought or question? I mean, this is my whole career troubleshooting. I get a hunch and I say something and it's generally not correct. And then I just go back to watching the smart people. Welcome to my life. (laughs) (laughs) I'm, it just seems weird. Like, so you're, you're getting these resets Uh, geographically. They're coming from all over the place. For some reason in my head, my head said that if you're single home, your ISP is under like some weird DDoS and, and you're just experiencing weirdness because of it. But I'm sure that's not it. That's where my head went. Like, why is this what, stuff coming from all over the planet, right? Why would you get responses? What I, what I find odd about this is that, if I, if I remember this right, I'm, I'm kind of trying to look through it. The first two resets were almost instantaneous. Mm. And then the third uh, sin, it took, what, 40 milliseconds before it got 
the uh, the sin act. Very good eye. In fact, my eye caught that too. Right? I don't know if that has anything to do with it. Hey, but <laughs> no, that's good. I'll, the IP never changed, right? Look at the target. Let's right. just say 201, 201, 201. That's the, the server's IP in this case. So we're, we're talking to this 201 box, and it resets, resets, then boom, we work. And the, a, a big indicator was I had 1.3 milliseconds and then sub-millisecond r- resets coming back. And then 44 milliseconds of network round trip time. If I pinged that server, it would have been 44 milliseconds. Okay. That's uh, my latency. Yeah. I was going to say, but why are you getting denied, you know, right at one millisecond? All right. So now that here's the question. This dude is not sending these resets, homie. <laughs> He's not. He's not even getting them. Okay, He's not even yeah. getting them first sends. It's too far. Yeah, because you're saying because say what you're saying is the the latency between the server and the client in this situation was around the forty ish milliseconds. How in the world could that server respond in one millisecond? Exactly. Yeah, some sort of a local proxy or, or firewall man in the middle kind of thing. Let's try and see if we could figure that out. So sin goes out, and a big thing that I've been look I look for now. This is actually one of um, this is one of the troubleshooting ex- exercises that really f- helped to form my troubleshooting process. And now I pay a whole lot more attention to a beautiful field in the IP header, Sonic Wall, called TTL. I'm going to add this as a column. Okay, and I mean down here, just so you know, Sonic Wall is in the ones that work too. Right, so it's a, it's the Mac, but yeah, let's come up here and check out, check out these TTLs. So, basically, time to live. So, what do we know about time to live at the IP header? So, that's the number of hops that I'll live before I, a router will drop me and send back an ICMP message saying, "Hey, your time to live expired." Mm-hmm. Right, prevents things from living on forever in loops. So, when a when a stack starts a packet, this sin is originating from this client. It's a, what we call a full count TTL. This is what that stack uses. Now, by 128, you can actually fingerprint or start to fingerprint that operating system. Now, I know if Windows for a long time used 128 to begin with. This is likely a Windows box that I'm starting with. Okay. Might not be. Possible it's not. But hey, just, a, just kind of an interesting fun fact. Okay, so client is sending 128. I know that this is an unrouted packet because it hasn't gone down, right? If I caught this at 127, then I know that there is Mm. a router between the sender and my capture point. If I capture it at 126, there's two routers between the sender and my capture point, 125, 124, right? So when I see these resets come back with 64, Here's the possibilities. Either. Now, the, the three big numbers this starts with is 64, 128, 255. Those are the big three-bit boundary numbers that TTLs begin with most of the time. So this tells me this is an unrouted packet because it's a 64. This, this reset in the IP header is showing TTL 64. It's not a 63. This, this packet didn't begin one router away from me. Or 62, two routers away from me. Another possibility is this started at 128 as well, and it decremented 64 times. But I look at the round trip time in a millisecond, no way. Mm. So I know this SYN is going, and an unrouted device on my network is actually sending this reset. Now the MAC addresses matter. Now I can look at layer 2. Now I come down to the sender at layer 2. The sonic wall is originating this reset. This was coming from the firewall. Mm. Now let's do this. Okay. This reset's coming from a firewall. Sin, reset, sin, reset, sin, synac. Now just for the people that are listening, the synac that actually came back through from the firewall has the same exact source Mac. So it's not like one 
sonic wall was resetting and the other was properly forwarding. It's coming from the same box. And in that case, my time to live is 244. Now, remember what I talked to you about? TTLs only start at 64, 128, or 255, and they don't go up. They only go down. So I know the true, the true box on the other end, if it's 244, I just do the math. This is 11 hops away from me. Mm. The true box is 11 hops away. Okay. So that's what works. This is with uh, the rest of this actually works, right? So coming up here, now I can see, okay, this sonic wall is sending out resets and then letting stuff through. And you know what I find? It's interesting because if I, if I remove my filter and this goes a, probably a little bit beyond what we're going to be, have time to do here in, in this conversation. What I find is that other connections were, were finishing between the, the one that worked, but between the SYN and the SYNAC, I found out that other connections that that client was having out to the internet were actually finishing in that amount of time. So the SYNAC came back through, and in, in, the, in between that, between the SYN and SYNAC, I had another connection that was either thinned or reset or it terminated. So now I'm going, wait a second. It's almost like the firewall has a, a limit. Mm like a connection limit. Like Tim, you get a hundred and, and Dan and Andy, you guys get a hundred. Everybody gets a hundred connections. Once you hit your ceiling, I'm resetting you. That's what it started to feel like. So would you believe it? We go and go to the, the sonic wall. We take a look and dig through the configuration. We find connections, TCP connections permitted per user. And somebody set that to 100. <laughs> <laughs> we call Sonic Wall. I say, it's this box. It's this this much utilization. It's this version. It's this is that that. You tell us what this should be. And they went, Chris. Why on earth did someone put that to a hundred? I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then I asked the client, like, who put this to a hundred? Oh, probably Jimbo. He's gone way. He's off to somewhere else now. <laughs> I, said, I bet he is. <laughs> left you and guys he's laughing. With he left you with this burning dumpster fire. It's actually kind of fun prank. He said it to a hundred the day he left. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Sure that's why Check I locked, that change log. Lock down your stuff, man. <laughs> so anyway, so I said, "What do you recommend we use?" He's like, "Oh, you're comfortable, comfortably able to do 300, if not 500 connections per user easily with that kind of load." We flipped it to 500. Why not? More power, and problem gone. Nice. All new connections were now able to be established. This is absolutely an example where the network was being blamed, and okay, I guess by all rights it was. But TCP is what led us to the symptom that brought the answer. And that's definitely a weird scenario too, you know, like that's not like, yeah. you know, you don't just go, oh, you know what it was or what I bet it is. I bet you it's their TCP connections on the firewall. I bet you it's our, like, <laughs> oh, that, yeah. that's not something you're just going to think of. So 100%. Well, Chris, I, you did uh, you did leave out the fact that later on you found out it was actually DNS. Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah. It's actually DNS. Well, I told you, I told y'all. There's two reasons I get called. It's either weird or intermittent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this this, this was, was a weird one. This was an awesome example. Yeah. I appreciate you showing yeah, us this. this. Great. Sure, and I, I think for me, what this speaks to is um, as a network engineer, what I realize is I don't know jack about the transport layer. That's what I'm thinking this entire time you were showing me that. I'm like, I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, through the the window of uh, Wireshark, what what I've tried to do is just grab hold of the transport layer horns and just force it to. I'm I'm gonna learn you, you know. And I think that's a, it's a missing layer in everything that we do. Cause I mean, if we think about it and I'll just, uh, I'll stop sharing for just a minute. Um, and you know, if we think about it, when a problem strikes, right? Like, uh, as network engineers, we go and we, we check our cables, we check the Wi-Fi, we check the switches, we check the routers. We might tap into the transport layer with a firewall, maybe just, Ooh, is a port open, but that's not really, really the full transport layer and everything that happens within that DCP stack. If you flip that to the application developers, yeah, they're in their coding. They know their stack a little bit that they're interacting with, but they know the application, might know a little bit about the kernel that they're using. They don't really understand TCP either. Network and developers, there's a big old gap. 
with the transport layer. And that's why 99% of the time I begin there mm. because that's probably going to lead me within minutes. I'll be able to figure out, is it that way or that way? Is it the mm. network? How's latency or packet loss? If there's no latency, no packet loss, everybody go home. No, it's not the network. All right, application guys, I'm seeing a 30 second delay off of this database. Why? But for, for that reason, do you ever get calls from the application guys or do you only hear from the network engineers? Actually, I just did. I just didn't, uh, I had an email when I was jumping on here with from a client that I'm working with. It's an, they're developers and they're developing their own TCP stack. And um, they, they called up and they're like, this thing is not working with this game. And I'm like, let's check out the TCP stack. And just the way that it was implemented, they they didn't know a lot about the options that they were mm. configuring. So they left off a few really important options that the server was expecting or wanting to work with. Mm -hmm. So that impacted the way the kernel would accept that connection. Very cool. I'm, I'm and only that's nothing this. the network can do. Why, because we're talking about the transport layer, why would developers create their own TCP stack? I just think that they hate life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, TCP works just fine. Like they're... They're taking the standard and saying, we want to do something special. No, nah, yeah, they're doing something real unique with it. Okay. They're building their own interface with its specific tunnel. And a good old TCP thing. wouldn't serve them. So they're like, we're going to do our own thing. Yeah, in this case. So so let me ask you, um, when when you first got that problem and they sent you that packet capture, like how long did it take you to, to figure that out? Because usually when I start pulling out Wireshark and getting people to get captures... The pressure's on, and I feel like I make more mistakes in that moment, um, you know, just trying to misreading uh, a capture and that kind of thing. So I'm just curious, like, how long did it take you to actually figure that out right there? I think that's a good question too, Dan, because I just basically, I call it the cooking show. Yeah. You know, you ever, you ever watch a cooking show and you just go, oh, it's, this is pre-done, and boom, 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 and yeah. dang, it's already out of the oven. <laughs> Look what we have. Let's all eat. <laughs> like, those are usually when I'm demonstrating something for you guys, you know, and we're whipping through it. You know, I right. didn't see it like that. Um, this took a, a few hours. Okay. But it took me going, hmm, is that real? Are, are all these servers really resetting me? No. Gotcha. Something's resetting me and it's not them, you know? Yeah. So then I just start asking myself those questions and it, I do go for a bike ride hmm. and I do go for a swim. And yeah. you think about it sometimes. Yeah. And my my poor wife, you know, if I'm really on a on a analysis gig that's just burning my brains, I'll wake up at two thirty in the morning with the answer. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be like, it's the congestion window, and she's like, "What are your dreams about?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, I better be in one of those dreams. <laughs> but uh, no, it's like I'll wake up with it, or you know. And I think that stress is real, Dan. What you said, it's usually high pressure, oh, high yeah. a lots on the line, and and uh, and I, I think I'm kind of a adrenaline junkie that way. I love that, nah. you know, so <laughs> I I like it except for the fact that like when you have management sitting behind you, like, what is it? What is it? You know, and, and you're just like, I don't know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, and I use the fireman example, like, don't, don't put that poor fireman out there the first time yeah. with a hose on a burning building. You know, I mean, let, let, let them go out to the parking lot and figure out how this thing works. Yeah, right. So that's why in, in my courses, you know, I have a course that's coming up in just a couple of weeks. Everyone should check it out on, a, on September 19th and 20th. We go into a sandbox and we learn how to drive. We learn hmm. how to set filters, how to make, make these coloring rules I'm showing you guys. And here's the, honestly, the legit top 10 things that I do every single time I open up a PCAP. And that takes some of that fear away hmm. and the overwhelmingness away. And I give them examples that help them to successfully find the answer. And then they go, Oh, okay, this is fun. And once they say that, I know that they're going to be okay because now it's like, all right, see how fun this was. Now here's another example. Now let's look at your network. Now you tell me within the next week, what you found on your network and keep that, keep that excitement for it. Cause it's fun stuff. Yeah, I'm definitely going to start some uh, packet captures stuff. now. <laughs> Just be like, 
Cool. Chris taught me the TTL. I need to, there's only a couple of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So, so Chris, I, I wouldn't want to leave you without looking at another example where you disprove that the network uh, was the problem. So uh, can, you, can you walk us through another PCAP? Well, another one? I'd love to show you one more. How about another one where uh, it was slow? It's the network thing? Sure. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Problem, problem set up. I do have some cybersecurity, cybersecurity examples, but I, I think for the networking audience, this is a better yeah, yeah. way to go. Agreed. Right. I mean, there's like hacks and attacks and how an ARP poison works. And that's just fun stuff. Like, right? you know, I think it's fun. But anyway, okay. Um, problem. Buddy calls me. He's a... Uh, uh, a guy that I've done a bunch of work with, just to, he's become a friend. He's in Seattle, and he, he's he's responsible for moving a database from one server to another in a data center. Servers are right next to each other. No latency at all, gig attached, gig attached. Okay? Primary server, backup server, he's literally just sending 60 gigs over to the other side. That's it. Copy. Go. Hours later, it's still going. Mm. As this database, so every night he'd back it up. As this database grew and grew and grew and grew and grew, it would actually make it to where it would take all night to copy it. Like literally it was still running and finishing when he came back the next morning. What are they blaming? Network. It's the network, right? Like, oh, we, oh, that shouldn't, should be fiber. It should be uh, 10, 10 gig or 100 gig or whatever, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, give me a break. You're on <laughs> Take gig it. to gig. <laughs> Can we just do some math here? Let's just make this very simple. If, if it's 50 gigs, okay, that's 400 bits, 400 gigabits, right? 50 gigabytes is 400 gigabits, right? Mm. If I'm moving one gigabit per second, it should take 400 seconds. This thing should take seven minutes to move. Yeah. <laughs> Not seven hours. Right. If everything was optimally being used. Okay. That's our backdrop. Let me go ahead and... Did you say these are two servers in the same rack? Same rack. to the same top rack switch and... Yeah. Yep. Same ASIC even. Does it matter how they're moving it? Like, is this like a V center, whatever? I don't know the V stuff, but that's a good that question. Play or no? At the at the time, it was an application that was moving it. Um, you know what's funny? I don't remember the name okay. of it. It's been this is this PCAP's a few years old. So, okay, there's only two IPs in this whole packet capture. Okay, so one one of the first things that I do is I I like to go up to statistics and go to conversations. And I like to go over to TCP just to see what are my carriers here? What am I really looking at? And this is one of the questions that was asked earlier. How do you, uh, how do you whittle down on problems quickly? Well, here I can say I only have one IP conversation. And if I come over to TCP, I have two TCP conversations over that one IP conversation. So now look at my port numbers. If I look at the number of packets, I've got 5,000 on one of those connections. And on the other, there's only 12. This 5,000 is the one I'm looking for. Non-standard ports, 472, and then a high side ephemeral port number. Okay, these are all notes to self. This is what I'm talking my brain through right now. Like, okay. If I come over here to close, all right. Again, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start at the top and just scroll on down to the bottom. Now, what do you not see that we saw before? The sins, uh, the resets, the synac. Yeah. Nice. The TCP conversation. No, good job. I don't see any tcp.analysis.flags. These are resets. I see a couple of window updates. Okay, whatever. But I see, I don't see any resets, do packs, black lines, red letters. Okay. And if I look at the delta time up here at the top, this thing is absolutely ripping. This is all sub millisecond here. So if I, I have a column on my copy of Wireshark called Delta and it shows me the number of, and the amount of time between packets, right? And I see 247 microseconds, 123, 123, 122, blah, 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 you know. But I don't see, I mean, the biggest one is 200 microseconds. Big deal. That's not causing hours of delay, right? 
So another thing my eye does, time to live, this is all on the same routed, remember I said about 128, right? So uh, the, both sides are saying 128, so we're not going through a router. Look at our IPs, which I actually changed from the real ones, but 101 is talking to 102, there's only two boxes. Uh, 101 is the sender and 102 and 1.2 is the receiver. I can take a look at the fully loaded packets are coming from one to two. And then the empty acknowledgements are coming from two to one. Data is going, the sender is 1.1. The receiver is 1.2. So now all I got to do is figure out which one of you two takes your sweet time and why. People don't call me because things are too fast. <laughs> People call me because it's slow. And they also don't call me when it's a couple of milliseconds, unless they experience a couple of milliseconds 100,000 times death by latency. So let's go ahead and do this. I'm just going to start to just take a walk down my little thing here. I'm My eyes are looking for, and I, I can do this faster. I'm just being realistic on how I first started out here. What my eyes are looking for is a jump in time that's bigger than a few microseconds. All right. Let me just come down here, just do, 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 and look at packet 140. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot of time, but look at it in context. That's 19, 19 milliseconds. That's surrounded by microseconds. Mm. Let's, just, uh, let's just say that this decimal point was over three points, okay? So now I'm looking at 19 full seconds, 20 seconds. Let's just say, let's just put it in that context. The rest of this would be sub-seconds. This would be 123 milliseconds, mm -hmm. 254 milliseconds, 20 seconds, 71 milliseconds, 52. So in context, this is way the heck small, uh, slower than anything else around it. Okay, note to self, 1.2 took 19 or 20 milliseconds to reply with an empty ACK. Hmm. All right. Keep going. Let's see if this was just a one-off. Let me go ahead and scroll, 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 scroll. Ba -ba. When you say I, empty act, it's because the segment length is zero? That correct. column? Is that this, what is, you mean? Okay. this is TCP segment length. That's the amount of contained payload. This allows me to see, is this packet loaded? Does it have payload? Does it got data? Or is this just an acknowledgement of that data? Right? So that was a good question. As I scroll, 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 scroll. Do, do, do. Some people don't like scrolling. I do. I'm hey, just for reference. Walking down the PCAP was Packet Head's debut album. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it all started right here. You guys heard it first. <laughs> Aren't you fortunate? <laughs> okay, so here I've got another one. Here's another delay, right? Okay. Dot two. Yeah. Empty yak. Okay. So now I'm actually going to sort this delta. Let's just sort this. And look at this, all these delays, well, most of them, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 19, 19, 19, they're all coming from dot two to dot one. So this is not a long PCAP. This is only, this is actually less than a full second. Um, if I sort this, put this back in order, if I scroll all the way to the bottom, this whole packet capture is a whopping 873 milliseconds. Mm. But of that 873, I've got all these pauses. In fact, something I can do is use a sweet little graph. I'm going to pick a packet. This is one of the loaded ones. Going to go up here to statistics. Going to come down here to TCP stream graphs. Going to go to TCP trace. And here, this shows me the mm. sequence numbers increasing over time. Now, for the, for the listeners... I'm looking at a line that's very jagged. It almost looks like a stair step. Looks like I'm going up and then I have a flat line like a stair step. And then it goes up and a stair step and then up and a stair step. Now, my goal when I'm moving data from one TCP endpoint to another is I want this line to be as steep and unbroken as possible. Because that represents full data being sent with no delays. Mm. Just like if I was sending you, if I'm your neighbor and you ask me to help you fill your pool and you say, hey, g give, me, g give me the hose, turn on the hose. I want to, I, you want me to crank that water on and just let it flow, 
right? You don't want me to be over at the spigot, turning it on and then off, and then on and then off, and then on and then off. You'd be like, really, dude? That's something Dan would do to me. 100%. <laughs> Dan, would ca- Dan would carry buckets over. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's keep that in mind, because I'm going to use that analogy a little further here in a second. All right. So this is a stair step. I call this stepping. We have a persistent delay. Every single 20 milliseconds that you saw on the PCAP at 19 milliseconds is that flat line you see. Mm, Okay. Now, who was causing that? Was it the sender or the receiver? Do you remember? The receiver. The receiver. The receiver. Receiver Receiver was saying it delayed. Now, the sender stopped sending, too. Something made the sender stop. It waited for something, and then it resumed. But the receiver is the one that we were seeing that delay on. So let's do this. I'm going to close this. I'm going to look at something called, and this is one of the things that network engineers, everybody out there has to learn this because this is stuff we get blamed for 100% of the time, and it's not our fault. You can tell I'm a network guy. (laughs) All right. I'm going to... Look at this packet here. I'm going to go to the one just before it in this direction. And I'm going to come down here to this little value, just collapsing everything here and reorienting my screen, TCP. I'm looking at the TCP header in the packet just before the point of pause. And I'm coming down here and I'm coming to this little value called window size. Now in this thread, I didn't get the handshake, So I didn't know if this had some other values that were involved here, but I'm just going to tell you, take it from me. There was no window scaling here for anybody that knows TCP well enough to know the window scaling. That's not involved. There was no window scaling on this connection. So this number that you see here is real. What this number means, this is window and it says 2299. What the the receiver is saying is, hey, partner, I only have enough room in my receive bucket for 2299 bytes. That's all you can send me. Sender sends one more full-size packet, then waits. Looking at that delay, this window just cleared out. 65, 535. Now it's back up to the full-size window. So it was 2299, and then it was 65, 535. Let's go ahead and add this guy as a column. All right. So I'm going to come up to, let's just keep our eyes on this column now. I'm going to go up a little further. Okay. All right. So the 65, kind of pay, we don't have to pay attention. In fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to take, I just want to look at the ax. So I just dragged the 1.2 from the source column up to my display filter, dropped it, and it set the filter for me. Oh, nice. Quick tip, everybody. Stop typing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, man. No, I, get, I did too. <laughs> so check us out. 65.535. Now, what this means, when this is 65.535 at the beginning of this connection, what this means is, okay, Andy, you're sending me water, and I'm drinking it as fast as you're sending it. I'm keeping up. As fast as you are, back, going back to the neighbor in the pool analogy, you send me water, and I've got... Um, let's just say uh, a bucket to catch it in. I catch it in the bucket and I dump it into my pool. I catch it in the bucket, dump. I'm, I'm doing that so fast that I'm keeping up with the ingress water. Not a single bite dropped. But then this starts happening. You see this value here, this number, 64915? This number starts to drop. This represents the amount of space left over in the TCP receive buffer on the receiver. That's not an infinite number. When I have a TCP connection, I allocate resources to it, and those resources are finite. There's only a certain amount of resource that one connection can have. The TCP receive window is one of the things that is not infinite. So that's basically our catch bucket for ingress data. Hopefully the application empties that guy out as fast as data is coming in. Otherwise, data pools, and eventually that buffer fills, and the sender has to stop sending. So let's see if that happened here. 65535, 64915. Look at this number. It's dropping. 59, 47, 38, 30, 21, 19, 2299, 
we get one more fall size MSS, maximum segment, um, maximum segment size, and then we wait. We clear the buffer. The application goes, <laughs> scoops out all the stuff out of the buffer, and then we can go ahead and advertise a full, an empty buffer. Go ahead, keep sending. The sender goes, sweet, let's send. Let's watch this number here. These five, five, thirty-five. Okay, look, it's starting to drop again. Did you this? say this is not windowing? This is windowing. Oh yeah. Oh. This is a receive window that's congested. So in this case, it went down to 1459, which is one byte less than the MSS. If you notice on the other size, it was 1460s. Hmm. That's a common MSS because the TCP standard header is 20 bytes. And the IP standard header is 20 bytes. That brings me to my MTU of 1500. So 1460 is the, basically the max payload on an IPv4 TCP um, connection. This is one byte less. The sender can't even make use of it. Okay, we wait 14 milliseconds. We clear. Now we're back off to the races. So this is a window that keeps dropping. And then I see the delay. And then the window clears. Then it drops. And then I see the delay. Every time we go down, it drops, we delay, we clear, we resume. So this is an example where the client was getting congested. It was not clearing the TCP receive buffer out as fast as data was coming in. So the sender felt like this. The sender was like, you know, brr, here's some data. Stop. Okay, I'll stop. Here's some more data. Okay, I'll stop. Here's some more data. Okay, I'll stop because you're full. Like, here's some more data, right? Yeah. So it kept sending, stopping, sending, stopping, sending, stopping, sending, stopping, sending, stopping. And these delays just got worse and worse and worse. And Why worse. would the receiver fill up? Was the server busy doing other stuff? Like it was just constrained resources? Correct. I guess we're getting there. Oh, yeah. Other stuff. Yeah, it was a congested, it, it, it was running out of resource on the server side. It had other processes going. It was also, like a hardware constraint, right? Well, on the box. This, yeah, this this receiver wasn't optimized very well as as well. This application wasn't making good use of um the the TCP stack. It wasn't optimized for this level of ingress. Hmm. I'm kinda like, you know, maybe it was better at smaller files. Like if this is a website, you probably wouldn't notice it because we're not moving a ton of like when you go and connect to a website, you're just Pulling down a bunch of small things, mm. but when you're when you're putting pedal down and moving sixty gigs, that's a different story. Right, you got to be optimized for that. But if this receiver wasn't doing anything else, if its only job that night was to receive that big file, could you think it would have been fine? Possibly, possibly. So I showed him this problem, and that was my question: like, what else? What else is going on? He's like, Yeah, I do have a couple of the processes, but. Man, this thing's slow. I was like, yeah, okay, so let's do this. Let's tinker with the application. So we did. We got in there and we found that there was, at the time, an option to be able to multi-thread mm. this application. So instead of, you notice that everything is going over one TCP connection. So I was like, well, why don't we try offloading some of that pressure into other TCP connections and see if we can basically lighten the pressure on this one poor connection. We did that and the problem went away. We didn't see, mm. once we spread the workload over eight connections, things moved a lot faster. Mm. In today's world, you probably wouldn't see, you, you would see the TCP stack more optimally used. But one way that I used to be able to force a problem like this is I would open up like 30 tabs on a browser and just have a bunch of stuff going and I could force a zero window. Mm. Mm. I, could, I, could force, I could force the client to be busy and the browser doing so much that it, it can't clear out all those TCP buffers. But here's an example of something that was the network was absolutely being blamed. The problem was 100% at the TCP kernel level within the receiver. Hmm. There's nothing the network could have done about it. So what, what caused it all to go over one single TCP connection? Was that the application? Like what was makes the that design, decision? The, the designer of the application. So, so there you go. You said you changed that. I mean, did the app did the app owner have to change something on their end? There was an option within that app where we could tinker uh, with that okay. setting. Thankfully, uh, yeah, right. 
But I mean, right there, how many how many developers know how a TCP window works? Right? They're they don't when they go oh one thread, you know. I mean, now I think there's a bit more awareness around it, but you know this this type of issue. The reason why I like this PCAP is there's absolutely nothing the network people could have done. Right. Yeah. Huh. All the fiber and upgrading and reducing latency to the nanosecond wouldn't have <laughs> changed a thing here. So that's where, again, weird, slow, that's a, that's a corner case for packet capture. Beautiful. Cool. That was awesome. I, I so badly, <laughs> I so badly don't want to be like, and there we go. The blame is off of the network, but it, <laughs> Like you just, I mean, you just like nailed it on that part. Though. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think there's something important out of that is not only in this case, and I'm sure in, in many other cases, not only can you use packet captures and Wireshark to find that, hey, the network isn't to blame, but you can also help by saying, I think you need to look here or let's take a look at this. Yeah. It's not just a wash your hands of it and walk away. Um, you're able to to find that next. I don't want to say finger to point, but <laughs> the next uh, avenue to explore. Yeah, but I think well, that's also like extremely valuable for you know, even even your company as a whole, right? Because if you're able to point, you know, a developer or whoever owns that application in in this use case, like, hey, look here, you've got one TCP uh, stream right here going like use more sessions or, or, you know, if they have that option or if they know how to actually, you know, make that an option in their application. Um, it, I, I think there's a lot of value in that. I could see other teams wanting to work with you if you're able to help them on even their own issues. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's why in, in, um, there's been quite a movement, especially in the last few years about, okay, we, we can't, as network engineers, we can't just say it's not the network anymore. All right. Like we, we own the highways and byways and speeds and feeds. We have the capacity typically, we're, we're, the, we're the silo within a, the organization that can capture. Hmm. So that if, if the, now the burden's on us to read those captures. Because I've worked with clients before. Oh yeah, we took a PCAP and we sent it to the developer. <laughs> Boy, did that hit his bit bucket? Yeah, what's he gonna do with that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's not gonna open the PCAP and go, "Oh, there's my problem. It's a TCP window congestion issue." When you open that PCAP, the first thought I had, just because it looked so different, like, "Well, why aren't there any sin or sin acts? Like, why is it all acts?" And I didn't because I'm like, "Well, that's just gonna sound dumb. Like, this is it's my second PCAP ever, and I'm not, you know what I mean? I'm not trying to like." put my foot in my mouth, but it was, it was one damn session, right? I mean, that was the damn problem. Andy, Maybe you found your calling Andy. Andy, we're, we're, we're going somewhere here, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know how I know I love networking. Like sometimes we just I'm not had a sure. breakthrough, Andy. Well, right. Like I love networking because honestly I could do this for hours. Like this is fascinating. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's late. I've been up all day. I had a busy day, but like, this is so cool. I could watch. I could watch you teach PCAPs all night. So I guess oh, I'm in the fun. right field still. Well, yeah. Well, and and it's coffee. also understanding too why the field needed to move forward at the transport layer. Like this, what I just showed you was a fundamental driver toward why Quick is now delivering so many. I mean, right now this conversation is happening over Quick, you guys. Hmm. Unless we're blocking it, this is over UDP. <laughs> hmm. He's about to do a capture. He's going to do a capture. So. Right? I think so. Did you just see his eyes just get... <laughs> He's like, so, so we're UDP, oh. guys. Yeah. Oh, look at him. Oh, oh wow. This ain't TCP, yo. It's a, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is quick. In fact, is it... Actually, it's, I, I just lied. It's not quick. Is it, it's not 443, but... Well, quick can run over a separate port, but whatever application we're using for this stream is being delivered. The, the media part is being delivered over TCP, uh, UDP, but you see there's a few TCPs that flash by. The RTCP? I bet you that's probably, yeah, so that TCP burst, that's probably control traffic. It's probably like a TCP check-in. Yeah. Uh, okay. And you'll hmm. see stun. Yeah. 
So anyway, but that's a driver of, you know, what, what I just shared is what we saw in the industry and TCP. It just, we started to outgrow it. It was created at a time when all you needed was two bytes of receive buffer. Yeah. Now Windows scaling has changed. I mean, now now you can have a gig buffer if you really wanted to, but but you know, in TCP, it's it got a little stressed. So that's why Quick is out there now, and it just became a standard. And you're starting to see more and more shift over to the smarts. It's not that uh, UDP is a better carrier. It's just like, hey, UDP, I just I want you to not think. Just do. Just send. I just want to send that. and full send. Let's let the guy above you do the thinking. Speaking yeah. Dan's yeah. language now. <laughs> hey, that's that's all. That's what I'm all about. Click that button. <laughs> yeah, I don't need no stinking. What cab. they pay me for, man? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, got really honestly, excited. I, Andy, I got I got one switch sitting behind my router at home, and I looked. It's a 3550, and I looked it up, and it I can configure a span port on. I'm like, oh my god. So yeah. I'm gonna, uh, yeah, that's 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 my action item or my takeaway, right? Is I'm I'm gonna hook up a laptop. I got to figure out how to set up. I tried logging in while we were talking, and I don't remember the damn password to my own switch. But <laughs> once I could get into the stupid thing, I'll set up a span port and try to hook up some Wireshark, and then bother you for filters. And heck yeah, that'd be awesome. And you have I a like ton it. of YouTube it- content, right? That teaches all this stuff. I, I checked out your your channel. You just have an endless amount of content on there to teach people. Yeah. So what I did is uh, I have a series on my um, YouTube channel where um, I, I, I basically break down the TCP handshake and look through all the options, like literally one feature at a time. How does, how do um, do packs work? How do retransmissions work? What is a window? What's a, you know, just breaking down all these ideas and the congestion window. What the heck's that? Just, trying to simplify this thing. And um, I I find I get a lot of comments where people are just like, it's just that little understanding that little piece, one piece at a time has helped to take out, take out, take away the mystery. There's a lot happening at the transport layer, man. A lot. And we get blamed for it. I (laughs) can't, which is why I was surprised. Now. I, I mean, I was thinking over here on the network side, like, look, we're down here at layer one, two, three, a lot. Why would we be transport layer experts? I thought in cybersecurity, like these dudes are writing their custom little tools and like they're doing packet injections and, you know, interrupting TCP streams. These guys must be rock stars at the transport layer. So I was like, okay, this year for DEF CON, I was like, I'll, I'll teach a TCP for hackers course if you guys are interested. And DEF CON jumped all over it. They were like, we need to know the transport layer. None of us know it. I was like, are you serious? And I went there and they were like, no, legit. And the, there, it was well attended. We had a great time. We just took a cybersecurity slant to everything that you guys just saw. What, is a, what does a DDoS botnet attack look like? What does malware look like? How, do you can, how can you tell if you're getting man in the middle? How does a TLS cert look when it's been adjusted? Like hmm. all of that you can do from the wire. And um, I realized like that, is a missing gap in this. It's not missing, but it, there's some headway to make on the cybersecurity side, which is why you, you're going to start seeing a lot more of that in my channel. Nice. I learned more about layer four in this past hour or so than I've 10 years in the industry. Every, every place I was at, you know, I got a route to it. I can ping it. I can trace it. All the hops are good. They're, you know, no latency, like firewall problem. Go talk to them. Right. Like I just, because I didn't manage the firewalls and I couldn't. And so this has been super informative for me. And like, oh my God, how many problems can you find and, and you know, identify, right? At the transport layer. And I've never looked at it. Well, I got to hard drive more examples, so. <laughs> <laughs> super informative, man. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Cool. I'm, I'm glad you got excited about it. I, I, I certainly am. I, I hope that comes through. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. 100%. 100%. Cool. Chris, this has been a super fun conversation. Uh, I know we've kind of danced around your YouTube channel and your social profiles. Let's uh, let's throw them out there so people can find you. Uh, what, what's your Twitter? Do you have a blog? What's the YouTube channel? Shout it out. So my company is Packet Pioneer, and that's my also my Twitter handle. So at Packet Pioneer uh, on YouTube, 
at this point, I think I have enough. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to sound like full of myself or whatever, but you should be able to type in Wireshark and you better find me within the first five <laughs> videos. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> if, if you don't, then I'm doing something wrong. But yeah, if you just search Wireshark on YouTube, hopefully a few scans you'll get or scrolls, you'll get to me. Um, and uh, the channel, I post tips and tricks about Wireshark, um, just how to do all of this and make packet analysis simpler, um, both for network performance, troubleshooting, and cybersecurity. Uh, apart from that, you're going to notice in a lot of my uh, my YouTube videos, you'll also see down in the description that there's a Udemy course that I wrote. And on Udemy, if you just search Wireshark, you'll see it there. I teamed up with David Bombal to uh, go ahead and assemble and deliver a Wireshark for beginners course. So 10 bucks, and you'll have that. Um, also, I teach live courses. So every I do about one every other month, and I'll do a two-day Come one, come all. It's remote over Zoom. And uh, we go through a full sandbox box of PCAPs and learn how to set filters and demystify this art of packet analysis. So all those ways you should be able to to find me, my website, packetpioneer.com. Please reach out. Please subscribe. Check it out. And um, yeah, let me know if there's any types of interesting protocols that you'd like to see. I just searched you on YouTube and uh, your Wireshark Masterclass is the number two hit. So uh, definitely. Who's above me? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That's great. No, that's cool. Yeah, uh, yeah. That Masterclass, so what I did is I, that's like a mini course. So it's, it's a playlist. If you go, um, it, I think there's nine lessons there, but it's just the how to set up a profile, how to set filters, how to capture, how to do this yeah. on the command line. We haven't even talked about the command line. We can shred all of this stuff on the command line. Yep. Hmm. If all we can do is SSH into a box and do dump cap, and then we can go at it with uh, T Shark is Terminal Shark, and then just that's great for the cyber side. So you'll start to see some of that stuff. But yeah, that uh, check out that masterclass. That's all free, and uh, also the Try Hack Me Room. I have a recent video on my channel about uh, I just did a, a Try Hack Me Room walkthrough. So I walk you through each filter and how to set it. So. Yeah, and find me, everybody. That'd be cool to to meet you and see what other kind of content you'd like to see. Awesome. Chris, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This has been an awful lot of fun. Uh, we will get this episode out as soon as possible. And uh, if you're listening, make sure you go to the YouTube channel, subscribe, check it out. Chris showed us some awesome stuff here. You don't want to miss it. Uh, anything we should have asked you that we didn't ask you? When's next time? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. There we go. Awesome. All right. We'll see you next time on another <laughs> episode of the Art of Network Engineering podcast. Hey, y'all. This is Lexi. If you vibe with what you heard us talking about today, we'd love for you to subscribe to our podcast in your favorite podcatcher. Also, go ahead and hit that bell icon to make sure you're notified of all our future episodes right when they come out. If you want to hear what we're talking about when we're not on the podcast, you can totally follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Art of NetEng. That's Art of N-E-T-E-N-G. You can also find a bunch more info about us and the podcast at artofnetworkengineering.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.